Hi, I'm Connor and welcome to ADO. Friedman's H statistic, also known as the H stat, is a metric used to analyze interactions in a model. In last week's video, we discussed the theory and limitations of this method in depth. In this video, we will understand how to apply the method using Python and how to interpret the plots. This includes the overall H stat and the pairwise H stat. We'll also explore the difference between the normalized and unnormalized H stat. So let's jump to the notebook. You can find a link to this code in the description. To apply the H stat, we will use the Artemis package. This is a useful package for analyzing interactions in machine learning models. It provides other methods, including the Greenwald method and some model specific approaches. We'll be applying the method to the abalone dataset. Abalone are a shellfish delicacy. We want to predict the number of rings in their shell using features like shell weight and shuck weight, which is the weight of the meat. One thing to point out is that this dataset has some highly correlated features. You can see this in the correlation heat map for the numerical features. We'll come back to this at the end of the video when we discuss the limitations of the HDAT. We load our data set. We also do some feature engineering. Firstly, we exclude diameter and hull weight from the model. This is because we saw that it had a correlation of one with the other features. Finally, we create one hot encodings for the sex feature. We use these features to train a model to predict the number of rings. In this case, we have used a random forest, but keep in mind that the HDAT is model agnostic. This means it can theoretically be used with any model. One limitation of the HDAT is that it is computationally expensive to calculate. So we start by getting 100 random instances from our X feature matrix. Hopefully, this will be enough to get a stable estimate of the metric. We create an HSTAT object. We then use the 100 instances to calculate the HSTATs for our model. This is done by passing in the model and the instances to the fit function of the HSTAT object. From here, it is straightforward to visualize the metrics. Using this code, we display the plot for the overall interactions. To do this, we just need to set the viz type to bar chart over. For a given feature, this gives the percentage of the feature's effect on the predictions that come from the interactions with all other features. This is the plot for the second equation we saw in the theory lesson. The one that compared the prediction function to the prediction function under the assumption that the feature of interest does not interact with any other features. From this chart, we can see that the interaction effects of shell weight and shuck weight appear to be significant, at least more significant than the other features. About 35% of shell weight's effect on the predicted number of rings comes from the interaction with other features. This value is 27% for shuck weight and less than 10% for the other features. The question is, which features do shell weight and shuck weight interact with? To find out, we plot the pairwise H stat with this code. To do that, we now just set the viz type to bar chart. This plot shows the percentage of the features effect on a prediction that comes from interactions between the features. This is the plot for the first equation we saw in the theory lesson. The one that compared the features joint partial dependence function to the joint PD under the assumption that the features do not interact. This plot suggests that shell weight and shuck weight features are interacting with each other. Up 24% of the variation in their joint PDP comes from the interaction between the two features. Potentially, there's also a less significant interaction between length 
and viscera weight. Keep this in mind when we look at the unnormalized metric. A more intuitive way to visualize this information is using a heat map. This is actually the default plot for the package, so we no longer have to set the viz type. The diagonal of this plot gives the permutation feature importance scores for each of these features. We can see that not only is the interaction effect of the two features significant, but also their main effects. Another limitation we discussed in the theory video is that by normalizing the HDAT, we can end up exaggerating some interactions. Thankfully, the Artemis package also allows you to calculate the unnormalized values we saw in the third equation. To do this, we use the exact same code as before, except we set the normalized parameter to false. In this heat map, we can also see the interaction between viscera weight and length no longer appear to be significant. So perhaps it was exaggerated in the previous plots. Notice that the interaction values are no longer between zero and one. So a downside to the unnormalized plot is we can no longer interpret these values in terms of the percentage of the effect on predictions. At this point, we should consider another weakness of the HDAT, spurious interactions. We saw that the features were highly correlated. So we need to ensure that the HDAT is not confusing the multicollinearity for interactions. One approach is to visualize the interactions in the underlying data set. To do this, we create a scatter plot of shell weight versus shuck weight and color the points by the number of rings in the abalone shell. We make sure to add a color bar as well. We can now clearly see the nature of this interaction. We can see that the number of rings tends to increase with shuck weight. At the same time, there are more rings when the shuck weight, weight of the meat, is relatively large to the shell weight. Potentially what is happening is that an abalone shell grows as it ages. At some point, it stops. The meat, however, continues to grow. This is why we see the oldest abalone have more meat relative to its shell. So despite the multicollinearity, the method has still produced some valuable results. This is a lesson that although you should avoid including highly correlated features in a model, they are not necessarily the end for model agnostic methods. You must simply validate the results using other methods. If you're interested in learning about other model agnostic methods, take a look at one of these videos. You can also get free access to my explainable AI course by signing up to the newsletter in the description. I cover the basics of the field and six different model agnostic methods.